Hello, it's February 15, 1990, and welcome to the Techniques of the Masters video conference. We've got a very interesting program for you today. We'll be watching commercial photographer Andreas Hyman work in his London studio, and we'll be taking a walking tour of the National Museum of Photography, Film, and Television in Bradford, England. Then we have a special experience for you. We're going to show you what it's like to go on a shoot with Arnold Newman. And both Andreas and Arnold are here with us in our studio today to answer your questions. I'll be giving you the call-in numbers in just a few minutes, so get a paper and some pencils ready to write them down. We're going to have quite a few calls today, I think, and I know you want to get yours in early. While you're doing that, I'd like to say hello to some of our viewers, which include Mark Green and Jim Gordon at Bowling Green State University in Ohio, Jim Newberry at East Texas State, Fred Miller at Colby Community College in Kansas, Dwayne Phillips at the University of North Alabama, watching from their new satellite dish, and Fred Baldwin, Executive Director of PhotoFest 90 in Houston, where today our show is the feature attraction. Welcome to you all. And now, here are the numbers to call to talk live to today's masters. Callers from Canada or Mexico, you can call us collect at 0716-724-0107. And our U.S. callers can call 1-800-262-3144. Our phones today are being manned by students from Onondaga Community College in Syracuse, New York. And we also have several of them watching in our studio right now. So welcome also to all of you students today. When you call in, our operators will ask you for your name and the school you're calling from. Please stay on the line. Your call will be answered in the order it was received as soon as we start our question and answer session. When you're connected, don't forget to turn down your monitor to reduce the echo. And for our international callers, remember there will be a slight voice delay because of the distance. And now to introduce us to our first master photographer, let's turn to Mike Garn, the producer of the Techniques of the Masters program. Good afternoon, Mike. Good afternoon, Debbie. Good afternoon to our audience, and good morning to our West Coast people. Today, I'm going to introduce you to a photographer that if you don't live in England, you probably haven't heard of, but you will be soon. Andreas Hyman was born in Germany, but he's lived the past 20 years in London. In the last six years, he's won growing fame as a top advertising photographer. He uses primarily large format cameras and produces images that look much more like art than advertisements. His style is difficult to describe because he adapts it to each, to each assignment, but he's certainly successful. This year at the Association of Photographers Awards, uh, at their exhibition in England, which this association is similar to the ASMP or the APA here in the United States, almost 20% of the photographs hanging belong to Andreas. So you can see he's made his impact. We joined Andreas in his studio as he was producing a billboard image for the Samaritans, a British charity agency. The ad was to illustrate the theme of having nowhere to turn. Also, we had the opportunity to talk with David Lambert, who is Andreas' agent, about the relationship a photographer and his agent have. Now, let's join Andreas in the studio. Well, I think London is a, a fantastic town for photography. It's, uh, it's gone better and better over the years. Uh, I like London because uh, the creative freedom, uh, especially in advertising, is absolutely fabulous. I used to have my doubts before I've done advertising, but uh, having done it now for several years, I enjoy it a lot. We have a very nice studio here with a lot of nice pictures of yours up on the wall. Do you mind if we yeah. went and take a look no, at some? No, let's, let's have a look. Let's do that. Oh, great. You know, Andreas, with all these pictures you have up here on the wall, I have a hard time telling your commercial work from your personal work. Oh, thank you. Oh, I, I take that as a compliment. I don't like commercial pictures to look commercial. And I think that's part of the reason 
why I'm getting the kind of work that I'm getting. The type of images I produce are, I'd like to see them as something that always has to come from deep inside. Every picture I take, or every picture that I put on the wall, I think, has to be honest. What do you mean by honest? I mean by honesty, I mean uh, no thought about any particular technique or style that I would want to apply to a particular picture just for the sake of trying to create a, a certain style. I just want the picture to be me, full stop. This was a picture for a company or an agency called Nalgo. Unfortunately, it had to be taken down because it was too political. That picture was uh, masked out in the camera on the ground glass. And uh, we took a second shot of the boy in order to keep, keep him in the right proportions. We had an exact silhouette on the ground glass before we took the still life. This is a uh, advertisement for mates condoms. When I saw the first copy lines, I thought they were pulling my leg. The copy line said, we'd like everyone to make love with their eyes open. And that picture, the first layout, was just a couple right above, just being next to each other, under, under, under the sheets, of course. So we kept moving in closer and closer and closer. It was much stronger, to, I thought, to see the faces rather than <laughs> the so-called action. It's one of my favorite pictures. Uh, of people because it's the ultimate voyeuristic picture, to me at least. <laughs> um, because the girl, despite the fact in what kind of situation she is, <laughs> she's really in love with the viewer, i.e. the photographer. I'm not claiming that she was in love with me, but that's the effect I wanted to achieve. And it's a very <clears throat> because of that, it's, a, it's very puzzling. And at the same time, I think, very beautiful. I have no preference to either studio or location work. In <clears throat> I think one has to make the best out of both worlds. In, on, on location, you have the beauty of surprise, especially weather and light. And you have to work most of the time with what's there. Uh, and in the studio, of course, you just do exactly what you want to do. Want to have him slightly further over there. Which one? Uh, with the spot, in case I'll use it to just light the face up. But I was hoping to do that with the HMI. The project is uh, a charity ad for people who have a speech problem. The organization who's doing uh, uh, the ad is called uh, Samarathons. The advertising agency is Saatchi Saatchi, and the art director is Fergus Fleming. Now, uh, they made a commercial previously, and they asked me to take uh, the photograph. Um, well, as you can see, there were two panels were made. The reason why they're angled here at the top is so that the light can be as close as possible and at the same time uh, it can be angled. That top light over there has got a honeycomb that I get just the idea of beam light coming down. And um, I will be standing here in the corner and trying to get the bottom half of my body cut off. Um, the reason, and I'll have to scream. Now the reason for this is um, uh, it's for charity, and uh, it's supposed to uh, inform people about a helpline, uh, people who have a speech problem. I'm using a wide-angle lens, a 210 uh, millimeter, um, and I'm going to use a mask, uh, which I first 
uh, I first shoot the upper level. Of course, this is puzzling. Everything is in reverse to what you see. I take one shot like this, and the next shot like that with this blind up. Now, to judge that, you have to stop the lens down all the way. Otherwise, you don't know what's going on. It's important not to touch this lever at all. Move this absolutely dead down to the same line. If there's the slightest gap, you will get a line. And if it's overlapping, you will get a white line. Hello, studio. A colleague of mine uh, came over here who knows my pictures, but he's never seen the studio. And he was very surprised. He said, my God, Andreas, I didn't think you had, you were so heavily into computers and technology. Your pictures don't look like that. And I think it would be wrong if uh, my pictures would look digitized or, or whatever. I like using the uh, video camera, especially in the studio. It's uh, very convenient. Uh, while I'm doing the picture, I let the video run. Mm -hmm. and uh, I play it back and watch it on the monitor. Now, with the flash going off, I can, with the editing control knob, I go back exactly to that frame and we can see it on the monitor. Voila! That's and control. if need be, even uh, do a printout. It's very easy and uh, rather than taking Polaroids, uh, I mean, very often I, I find uh, that the best pictures, if you're not careful with people, if you carry on taking too many Polaroids, you lose the shot. That's fine. Oh, this is brilliant. Oh. We've got it. We can do that now on real film. It it's also, touch um, overexposed, but yeah. we, uh, which we'll is fine. I'd rather have a bit of meat in the negative. Yeah. Then we print it down and keep the highlights all open here. Brilliant. How long do you think for that? How long do you think before they... Very good. Then the glasses, I'll have them a bit do lower. Okay, Wonderful. So Let's it, just yeah. crop that one Cheers, and see what that looks like. Yeah, fine. Yeah. Don't I think that's yeah. it's slightly off centre because that's where the line's going to be. The Samaritans understand. So the picture's there, so the whole thing um, fits. Because oh, right. if the picture's in the middle. So cut like that in order to keep the typeface yeah. in balance. Yeah. Yes. All right. Okay, but basically, I think we're there, no? Yeah, let's, let's take it. All right. The worst thing is to do a picture and say, thinking, well, this is it, I've got it, the client will be happy. I never like that. I think it's uh, good to show a picture which uh, <clears throat> goes above the expectations. Uh, from either the agency oh, or the client. It's actually, it's I love mixing uh, tungsten uh, with flash. Cool. Uh, the reason being is the control yeah, of the tungsten. Mm -hmm. Now, I used to use um, normal lights like redheads with a uh, conversion filter, and I find it's not as satisfactory okay, as a proper uh, HMI light, which is pure, pure daylight. Your left hand should be Nearly on top, more like this. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the negative I overexposed a touch so that I, what I call, <laughs> I have meat in the shadow detail. And uh, the advantage of shooting on color negative rather than transparency is that you can keep your shadow detail in printing and burn the highlights in as much as you'd like. There's no such thing as a perfect negative. There's always something that you can improve. There's a danger that one carries on too far. I think uh, it's good to know also in the picture, already at the picture taking stage, of what you're going to do eventually. I will close the shadow detail down. I will let in the highlights and just take details out of the forehead, say, and the top of the arms to make it look even stronger. There we go. What made me attracted to his work in the first place? Um, it was the second exhibition I'd seen at the AFAP Awards, and I thought, 
he doesn't have an agent. This is quite strange. But I thought maybe he doesn't want to do advertising. Um, and to. maybe he's, because he's so keen on his exhibitions, he, he, he's really happy. But then I thought maybe he needs to earn a little bit more money. So I rang him up. <laughs> I went to see him that afternoon. And um, we agreed to work together by about 7.30 that night, which was really nice. So I left about 8.30 uh, with a portfolio and seven or eight Stella Artois inside me. <laughs> <laughs> and it was really good, and we haven't looked back since. So um, that was the start. I mean, the first day I got the book, I took it round to an advertising agency, saw three art directors, and two of them gave us a job. How do you tailor a portfolio to a client? Um, yes, you have to know a little bit about the art director you're going to see, like the sort of work that he likes. Obviously, you have to know what accounts he's working on at the moment. And then you have to know a little bit about those accounts. Um, just because it's a food account doesn't mean it's food photography. I mean, it, you have to really understand the history of the client and what he'd like to see, and he would be looking for that as well. Um, but then on top of that, you have to realize that he knows all that, so he's going to go for a style, so you're still putting the style together. So you, you, you're quite free on what you put in, um, as long as you bear in mind that you know the person you're going to see. Sometimes, obviously, you see somebody you've never seen before, and then you have to make a little bit of a guess. And that way, all you can do is show what you think is pure quality, and that's what we always do. Um, one of our most famous campaigns, which was Lance and Champagne, I took Andreas's book in, I had it exactly right for the creative director to look at, and I knew he was going to be impressed. He gave us the campaign after looking at four pictures, and I carefully selected 45, and he only got down to four, and he got very excited and gave us the campaign. And that has led on to a lot of other work, especially from um, all over Europe. Tell me, David, what do you look for in a photographer? Good looks, nice body. Hips. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, it's, yeah, an ability to work in advertising, which is obviously ph photographic talent, um, which is the first thing you tend to see, because the first thing you see of a photographer is a portfolio. You see a lot of good portfolios, but then it's quite important to actually get into the character of the person, because advertising is very stressful. It's, it's very high, um, it's not so much high powered, but it's, it, it has a lot of deadlines, and you don't have the power to say, all right, a week next week. They tell you when the deadlines are, and, and not just the photography is going to determine this, it's the character of the person to take it all through, and that, that is one of the most important things with the talent of being a good photographer. It's incredibly important to get a good, strong person behind the talent. What is the job of a photo agent? Um, I suppose, to sum it up very quickly, it's to get him work, to keep him busy, because his job is producing the work, and that is more than a full-time job, to produce a lot of work. I have to do all the agency side, which is, once I've got him the work, is negotiate all the fees, make sure the money comes in. Um, it's probably very similar to being a producer in a film. You produce the jobs. Andres, how would you describe your relationship with David as a photographer and an agent? What do you get out of it? <clears throat> well, I get 75% uh, out of it. <laughs> <laughs> Is it 75? Yeah. yeah. No. Um, a good day. I get... Uh, it, it is a little bit like uh, being married, in, in, in some sense. Um, except you, we sort of uh, live a few miles apart. But uh, in terms of communication and understanding and agreeing with each other and David <coughs> understanding what's right for me and what's not right for me. That's very important and uh, David understands that. David, how would you describe your relationship with Andreas as a photographer and an agent? Um, it's, it's very strong, it's very close. I mean, my job is, as I said, to get him work and to keep him busy. Um, but I have to have a deep feeling of respect and friendship to get this uh, relationship to work, um, which obviously starts with the quality of his work and it builds from that. Um, at the moment, it's, it's a very good relationship. We work a lot. What do you mean at the moment? <laughs> well, we're talking about at the yeah. moment. I mean, we haven't had lunch yet. <laughs>
A photographer's uh, style, um, we talked about that earlier. I'd never know what if the style is really a handwriting. I always like to think of uh, a photographer, or rather, if I'm talking about myself, having personality in the pictures rather than a particular style. Because uh, with style, what do you say, it's like soft photography, hard photography, very loose, totally composed and whatever. I, I keep switching all these elements around, whatever I like. And uh, at the end of the day, or at the end of when you've got the picture in front of me, hopefully it has got that feel where I could say, yes, that's, that's, uh, that's my picture. I can identify with it. Well, I'm sure a lot of our viewers can identify with the type of work that Andreas is doing, want to do the same type. And here he is in our studio right now. Andreas, welcome. Hello, Mike. Hello. Nice to have you with Hello. us. Before we get into the questions, let me give you the phone numbers one time. Uh, in the United States, it's 1-800-262-3144. If you're calling from Canada or Mexico, it's one, I'm sorry, 716 0107. Call collect. We will accept charges. All right, Andreas, is your agent worth 25%? Well, I think so. <laughs> because I think he's listening to this program, so I better ah. say so. <laughs> <laughs> what sort of things does an agent do for you? He takes the hassle of uh, strain uh, money decisions uh, where he filters. Uh, work which he knows might or might not be right if it's a if it's a dubious question always he he would uh, give me a ring and ask me first do you think he allows you to be a better photographer or to con concentrate more on that oh definitely yes that's uh, the reason why uh, uh, why he wouldn't accept some of the uh, some of the jobs that come in hmm. okay so, I think it's interesting to, yeah. to meet okay. your agent. David, of course, was quite a personality. Let's go to our first caller. It's a Ashley Cabalas from Grossmont College in San Diego, California. Uh, Ashley, are you out there? Uh, actually, I had a question for Arnold Newman. Ah. <laughs> well, I appreciate your eagerness, but not... Arnold is going to be on a little bit later in the show. Do you have a question for Andreas? Actually, um, I don't. <laughs> well, in that I case, I assume you'll want to call back and talk to Arnold. Okay, thank you. All right, very good. Ashley, it was nice talking to you. While we're waiting for our next caller to come in, how about from our audience? Do we have a question? Go ahead. I'm Mark Sinclair from Andoc Community College. Um, some people, some photographers, think of photography as an art. Others think of it as a field of its own. What? Well, how do you feel on that subject? Is it an art or is it in a field all its own? Oh, the battle uh, has been going on for quite a few years now. Is photography art uh, or not? I, didn't, I think, who cares? I, d I honestly don't care. Uh, whatever people think about it. Um, it's certainly uh, an expression uh, which you could call, uh, call art just because it's repeatable, uh, a repeatable process. Once you've got a negative or a slide, uh, doesn't make it not art. But I, I wouldn't uh, have big debates about it or battles. Hmm. Interesting. Thank you. Got another caller on the line for Andreas. It's Joe Hippolito from Florida A&M in Tallahassee. Joe, are you there? Yes. Hi, Andreas. Hello, uh, Joe. I wanted to know uh, what do you feel is the best advice you can give to photography students seeking a formal photographic education? Um, I think uh, uh, two to three elements. Uh, don't pick up photography purely to make money. If you want to make money, work with money. The second thing, only show work that you like and don't think of images that other people might like, i.e. come back to the whole money process again. First satisfy yourself and then check what the reaction, reactions from the outside world are. Oh, okay. 
Okay. Does that help you? Yeah, that yeah, that's that's real good. Right. Um, I have one other question. Uh, it's uh, are you still able to exhibit your personal work on a regular basis now that you're doing uh, commercial work more of the time? Yes, I do that a lot. In fact, I even make a point of taking uh, time away in order to do personal work. If I would only uh, photograph ads all day long, despite the fact that it's a very time-consuming uh, process, I um, would be fairly unhappy. And also my personal work feeds, hopefully, the advertising. Okay, great. Hi. Thanks. All right, thank you. Joe, nice talking to you. Our next caller is Sant Calsa from Cal State San Bernardino. Was I close on that? That's very close. Ah, uh, good. <laughs> What's your question? Uh, the question is, what is his background? Uh, did he study, have formal training, either in uh, photography as art or in specifically commercial photography? No, so it's your name, uh, Sant? Sant. Uh, Sant. That's an unusual name. I've never heard that. No, Sant, my uh, background is... Uh, fairly technical. I used to, I was trained as a block maker making uh, films and separations for the printing process but I always knew that I would eventually want to be a photographer. Uh, and the background, well all that happened in Switzerland uh, because uh, the standards I always felt were uh, very very high and also at the time I was a very lazy uh, boy and I thought <laughs> the whole world will fall, all the goodies will fall into my lap. So the strictness and the discipline I learned in a company where I was treated fairly harshly from 7 o'clock in the morning to uh, 8 in the evening, it's done me a lot of good. Thank you very much. Fine, thank you. Very good. Sam, thank you very much for your call. Now let's go to Wichita, Texas, to Midwestern State. And Brian Yant. Brian, you're with us. What's your question? Uh, yes, I'd like to ask him if uh, he, if what it, what it is that exactly inspired him, uh, if he actually has a mentor, or if there was any special art that inspired him. Uh, well, Brian, I think uh, I have a, uh, my background, or should say my parents or my surroundings, uh, always loved uh, images, paintings. Uh, I was grown up with them and that helped me, I suppose that helped me uh, bec to become visually, uh, visually aware. It had just uh, a slight disadvantage at school time that uh, in as much that I could, uh, I was sometimes unable for example to concentrate on what the teacher was saying because I was much more interested in uh, the movements of, of a funny nose or a pimple the, he had on that day. Uh, so did, I think you asked a sw uh, second question, I can't... Uh, well, I, I'd li also like to ask you uh, if you've ever turned down uh, anything that your agent has suggested you to do, any of your work. Uh, yes, that did happen. Um, and it, very often it happens when uh, an agency expects you to be a magician. In some ways, uh, one, can, uh, one says that the camera can't lie, it, it's not true. But you can't be a total magician. And in some circumstances, I, I say that I can only photograph what's in front of the camera. I did, uh, someone did, for example, ask me to photograph the keyboard with a hand on it. And I said, I can't do it. Well, I, f I can do it, but uh, I knew they expected something very special. And uh, I had no desire to tickle something out of something incredibly uninteresting by hand coloring or manipulating it in any way in order to give them some sort of satisfaction. So that was an example of a job that I didn't do. But it's very, it's, it can be tricky uh, to say it in such a way uh, in order not to uh, offend. Does, does that uh, answer your question? Brian? Uh, yes, thank you very much. Right. I appreciate it. That's great. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. And now, how about a question from our audience? Tasha McCabe from Onondaga Community College. Andres, did you 
find any of your works that you've done particularly difficult, something that maybe you thought you wanted to just say, forget it, in the middle of the job? Uh, yes. Um, I find it difficult to work with an art director who is, I mean, being young isn't necessarily a bad thing, but some, it can happen that an agency has, say, maybe too much work on, and a very big account goes to that art director, and he comes into the studio, and I can see sometimes they can hardly walk, they're so terrified. I.e., they want to cover everything, and they already jump on the ceiling when they see the first Polaroid coming out of the camera. And you have to spend more time explaining that it's, this really, at this stage, has nothing to do with the final image that you're trying to create. So that can be, sometimes it can be quite hard. And you'd like to stop, but you can never even afford to think about it. <laughs> uh, especially if you have models involved to costing hundreds of thousands of dollars uh, an hour. Uh, and just a, a discussion or argument can cost a client two, three thousand dollars. Mm -hmm. So every word you say, every, every moment you waste, you have to be the director of the shoot and you have to feel responsible for it. Now if you have uh, an art director who is being difficult, you have to gently explain him the situation uh, and you can't really tell him that he doesn't know what he wants, but you must make him aware of that fact. So, uh, I think in advertising you have to uh, be a diplomat, uh, quite a good diplomat on occasions or clients suddenly drop in because they're spending a lot of money, they think they can just bounce into the studio. Well, I, I just stop a session when that happens. And, uh, and I explain that it's for their own good if they leave again. So. so you have to be diplomatic about it. That's right. I think diplomacy is sometimes mm. part of the key. Another skill for your bag of tricks. Yeah. <laughs> All right, let's go to Lafayette Jefferson High School in Lafayette, Indiana, and Judy Roberts. Hi, Judy. How are you today? I'm fine today. Well, what Hello. do you have for Andreas? I have two questions. The first one is, where and when can we see your work in the States? And the second question is, do you ever have time to do your own work? Oh, yes, Judy. Uh, thank, you. thank you for the question. I'd love to show my work in the States. I. Uh, I had a few inquiries, but I must be honest, I haven't done anything about, it, about them. One gallery asked me to do an uh, exhibition just of my nude work, and I uh, didn't feel, I wasn't too interested, because my first exhibition in the United States, I think, should be a wider view. And so your second question was, to do your own work. Oh yes, plenty, because I take pictures all the time, <coughs> even after work. Thanks. That's really good. I look thank forward you. to seeing your work. Oh, thank you. I hope you will. Okay, bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks for joining us, Judy. And now let's go to Texas University in Fort Worth, uh, where Dr. Punch Shaw is waiting. Dr. Punch, how are you? Fine. I found it very interesting that you use um, video in your still photography work. And I was curious, first of all, as to whether you have ever done any video or motion picture production. And also, do you feel that the techniques and general aesthetics of still photography are applicable to video and motion pictures, or do each of those media have separate and distinct aesthetic par parameters in your view? Oh, Dr. Punch, I think photography, video, and film are definitely uh, well, I would say two different elements uh, if I uh, put video and film together. But, uh, and also, I did direct uh, commercials rather than cinema. Uh, and there again, I feel the difference between the moving picture and the still picture are quite tremendous. But it's, a, it's very interesting to do, uh, uh, to do um, or to direct commercials. Uh, and thank you very much. All right, and thank you very much for your call. Uh, we'll now go to Cal State Chico, where Rosemary Sebo is waiting for us. Rosemary, did I get that right? Yes, you did. Oh, very good. Well, welcome to our show. And thank what's you. your question? 
Well, I'm writing a, a major in art administration, and I want to represent artists. And I'm curious to know if Andreas has any uh, points on what his agent does to bring out the most creative work. <laughs> Uh, so, Rosemary, you say you are, are you, you are a representative of photographers? Well, in, I, I'm going towards that. <laughs> are you, want to, you want to become one? Yes. Yeah. The, th uh, the, thing, the problem with having uh, several agents as a photographer is that uh, you will find when you start becoming an agent that they're do working very hard for the photographers they represent, uh, or so they should. and. If there's too much work, in, uh, work coming in from several agents, you find that work will overlap, and uh, i.e. rows will start to happen. Uh, so I don't think it's too good to have too many agents all over the country. If, you, if a photographer or any artist gets a reputation, then it doesn't matter. He doesn't necessarily have to go uh, to an agent who's just around the block. He, they will make the effort to ring wherever the talent is. Does your agent represent more than one photographer? Uh, yes, he does. He represents five, which uh -huh. to me is just about the limit. There are agents who uh, represent, uh, re represent up to 30 photographers, which I think uh, is wrong because uh, they might have problems even to remem remember their names. <laughs> well, thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Rosemary, thank you for joining thank us. Thank you, Rosemary. And now to Hawkeye Institute, Waterloo, Iowa, and Michael Brink. Michael, go ahead with your question. Hello, Andreas. Hello. Uh, what advice can you give someone starting out in commercial photography? Oh, Michael, that's a, Michael, uh, so that's a very open uh, question because I don't know at what stage you are. If you say you're just starting out, you finished uh, a certain kind of uh, training, or at what stage are you? Yes, after uh, finishing a, a certain stage of training, and uh, from that point, uh, working with clients. Yeah. I, so I would uh, recommend to show what you think is your best work to go out on the road and show it yourself. Uh, it's not a very good idea to expect to have an agent straight away. It's good to feel the heartbeat from agencies, or uh, if you want to work if you rather work directly for clients, see what their reactions is. Feel the frustrations of people talking to you uh, while they look at your portfolio. It's like this. It's terrible. It happens to everybody. And then they say, well, I love your work. Uh, don't call us. We call you. Uh, it's something everybody has to go through. It doesn't matter how good you are. And I think the ad main advice is don't lose your confidence, because the beginning is very, very hard. Does that help you? <laughs> yes, it does. Uh, oh, fine. thank you. All right, Michael, thank you very much for your call. Our next caller is from Brevard Community College in Cocoa, Florida. It's Elizabeth Hesselsinger. Elizabeth? Yes. Welcome to our show. What's your question? Um, I wanted to ask him on the behalf of the other students here at the school. Um, we were wondering what approach he takes in achieving the distinctive mood in his photography. Hello, Elizabeth. So, what approach do I take on? In in um, achieving that distinctive mood in your photography? Oh, to be honest with you, I don't know. <laughs> That's a terrible uh, answer. Um, when, I, when I'm being briefed, I'll uh, try to get some sort of feeling of what someone uh, wants to see eventually. Uh, that's the reason why people very often don't give me layout, or they just give me indicative layouts, and then say quite quickly, oh, but forget it, and go ahead and do it. Uh, and I move myself into that kind of uh, picture, what you've seen. Uh, but to say to this whole thinking process, like this lens and 5.4 or 35 millimeter, doesn't really go through my head. That uh, sort of somehow happens automatically. Yeah. Okay, thank yeah. you very but, much. Thank right. you very much. Elizabeth, thank you for your call. And thank, all, thank you to all of our callers for calling in. 
thanks to our students here for their questions and their attention. Andreas, it's been fun. Oh. It's been a pleasure working with Thank you. Thank you, Mike. It's been great to have you here. Thank you. Thanks Thank a lot. You. Debbie, back to you. Thanks, Mike. Mm -hmm. Interesting. And a safe trip home, Andreas. Oh, We've enjoyed thank you having very much. you. And now for the photo news. On January 20th, the newly restored George Eastman House celebrated its reopening with a gala celebration attended by more than 1,200 people. The extensive repairs and restorations cost more than $1.8 million and took over a year to complete. The newly refurbished first floor areas have been turned into a showcase, revealing the home of George Eastman as it was when he lived there. The extensive reconstruction took the labors of Polish artisans and who painstakingly uncovered and re-sculpted much of the lost trim and artwork and local historical experts who spent years searching for original furnishings. This was the first major renovation of the home since it became the International Museum of Photography in 1949. Techniques will be taking you on a tour of the house on an upcoming program. In other events, the European Kodak Awards were announced at Arles, France. Winner of the 1989 UK Young Photographer of the Year was Gillian Edelstein. Her winning portfolio of 10 prints consisted of commissioned work and images created solely for the competition. Gillian concentrates mainly on location work, and her photographs have appeared in publications such as Elle, Blitz, the Independent Magazine, and the Telegraph Magazine. Here in the U.S., the Medal of Excellence Award winners were announced at a celebration in New York City on January 11th. The Leica Medal of Excellence in book publishing went to James Natchway for Deeds of War. And Person of the Year honors went to Marianne Fulton of the International Museum of Photography at the George Eastman House. Students were also recognized at the dinner. Andrea Gentle won the Eastman Kodak Fine Art Photography Award, and the Leica Medal of Excellence in Photojournalism Award went to Alexis Martino. Another major photographic event just getting started is PhotoFest 90, which kicked off a month-long series of events at a giant gala last Saturday night in Houston. The last PhotoFest in 1988 drew the, more than 1,000 photographers and over 325,000 participants from 19 different countries. This is the third biennial International Month of Photography to be held and features a wide range of presentations, seminars, and more than 80 different photographic exhibitions in galleries and museums throughout the city. One exhibition by Pavel Šteka of Czechoslovakia documents the radically changing political landscape of his homeland. I think it was really a historic uh, break in my country. Uh, for example, this is Václav Havel, who had a respect and his strategy and his brilliant uh, way of uh, strategy, it was perfect. Because not so many people knew him before, I mean... He was a playwright. Uh, yes, but you know, it's a question of intellectuals only. For more information about programs and lodging at PhotoFest, call 1-800-537-4995. And now to tell us more about PhotoFest 90, we have Executive Director Fred Baldwin on the line. Fred, what's going on down there? Uh, yes. Is Fred there? Hello. Hi, Fred. How are you? Just fine, thank you. How is it going down there? Oh, it's wild. It's absolutely wild. And we've got people pouring in from all over the world. We've got Bulgarians and Russians have just arrived. And we've got Czechs, and it's, uh, it's fantastic. I hope everybody can get down here and see our 28 exhibitions at the George Brown Convention Center and the incredible installation, the Berlin Wall. Then we've got 75 other exhibitions all over Houston. So. If anybody can make it to Houston, they should really head on down here. Fred, the, it's interesting you mentioned the Berlin Wall. I understand that, there, that you have re recreated the Berlin Wall there with the graffiti well, on one side. What is the reaction to this? Oh, it's fabulous. So we not only created the Berlin Wall, but we've got uh, President Havel's plays uh, being performed in front of it every weekend on Saturdays, uh, and with a special message from President Havel of Czechoslovakia. Uh, that he did for us uh, a few weeks ago. And uh, it, the reaction is in, incredible here in the city. They, 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 not only do, do we have uh, watching the president's play being performed in front of the Berlin Wall, but then we have right next to it a, a wonderful exhibition of the 
Czech Revolution, and uh, from starting on November seventeenth, uh, right up till New Year's, and uh, all the Czech photographers who who were participating in that are here. That's terrific. Um, what is going to be happening tonight? I understand you have openings, what, every night of the Photo Fest? Yeah, there are going to be 22 openings tonight. Uh, of course, Photo Fest is open, but all the, all the galleries and museums in Houston are participating. I think there are 22 openings. Mark Rebu is opening tonight and, uh, from one of the great Magnum photographers, and, uh, and there are lots and lots of other ones. And then the next night, there are 25 openings, so there's lots of excitement, lots of famous journalists and uh, art photographers and editors and all kinds of people here. I think you've sold us. I think we Good. should all, well, all shut down. <laughs> well, come on down. We have a women in photojournalism conference and a publishing conference next week, and and uh, just get on down to Houston to, to the Photo Fest, and you'll have a you'll have a whale of a time. Through March 10th, right? Uh, through March 10th, yes, absolutely. Great. Thank you, Fred, for being with us. Thank you very much for inviting me. All right, bye-bye. Bye. bye. In product news, last October, Eastman Kodak Company announced the availability of the Kodak Stretch 35 camera, a member of the line of one-time use cameras, which includes the Fling and the Weekender. The Stretch 35 produces 12 3.5 by 10-inch panoramic prints on 35-millimeter Kodacolor Gold 200 film. Although produced for the consumer market, this camera has really captured the imagination of students all over the world, where they've been selling out as fast as stores can stock them. The camera, which features a 25mm f12 lens and a shutter speed of about 1 100th of a second, retails for $12.95, which makes it an inexpensive alternative to other panoramic cameras. On the environmental front, Kodak chairman Colby Chandler announced that the company has initiated a pilot program for the recycling of all plastic and metal components used in the packaging of 35 millimeter, 110 and 126 photographic films. The test includes eight major photo finishing labs in five states and will yield three quarters of a million pounds of recyclable plastic from over 60 million rolls of film which these labs handle annually. Mr. Chandler stated that, quote, if this pilot is successful, it will be expanded nationwide and serves as but one example of Eastman Kodak's long-standing commitment to environmental responsibility." End quote. And now for an update. Last program, we announced the introduction of RA4 chemistry and papers, which feature reduced color print processing time and means you can make more prints during a printing session. A lot of our listeners have expressed interest in converting to RA4, so we've brought in one of the Kodak professional photography specialists, Bob Miller from New York City, to point out some important things you should consider about conversion. Welcome, Bob. Thank you, Debbie. I won't go into great detail here, but the new products I'll be referring to are the Kodak Pro System RA paper and display products and the RA chemistry system. There are three RA papers, Portra, Supra, and Ultra offering three different contrast ranges that you can match to your specific needs. There are also three new display materials, DuraClear RA, along with DuraTrans RA, and DuraFlex RA. And with the aforementioned papers, it gives you a uh, choice of three display materials and a total of six print materials. And when you team these up with your companion RA Ectocolor Chemistry, you can cut your processing times in half. Now, for full details on these products, I would encourage you to contact your local Kodak TSR. And also, consider your TSR a, a resource for planning the conversion of your existing EP2 equipment to the new RA system. Advanced planning is the key to a trouble-free changeover. Now, there are a couple of important points you should consider when making the changeover, such things as your estimated usage of paper, the types and surfaces of paper you use, and the type and quantity of chemistry. Now, due to the large number of conversions being done, you should also be contacting your processor manufacturer to confirm the availability of conversion parts and the manufacturer's schedule for conversions. And be sure to find out what this will all cost you so you can get those numbers into your budgets early. Now, the next thing to consider is when do you actually want to do the conversion? You should schedule plenty of lead time to use up your remaining EP2 inventory. Because remember, the EP2 paper cannot, I repeat, cannot be run through the new RA chemistry. Now, we're finding that semester uh, breaks and uh, summer breaks 
are usually a good time to make the change. That way you won't be taking any equipment offline when it might be needed and students don't have to get acclimated to a new product in mid-class. Now once you've gathered all this information and you've scheduled your conversion, again I'd like to encourage you to contact your TSR to coordinate the arrival of the paper and the chemistry with the physical processor changeover. Now your Kodak TSR can also get you your copies of a Kodak Publications J27, which contains information on the RA chemistry, and Publications E140 through E143, which contain information on the paper and display products. And if you don't know the name of your Kodak TSR, you can find out by calling your local Kodak Regional Marketing Center. Also, for you educators out there, we'd like to encourage you to watch for an article about the new RA system in the next issue of the Photo Educator Newsletter. Thank you, Debbie. Thank you, Bob. Based on your expertise, do you consider this something <laughs> that uh, colleges need to consider? Um, I certainly think they do, Debbie. There are some distinct advantages that, that these products hold over our uh, existing products, and we've mentioned some of those. Uh, I think one of the biggest things from a learning situation in, in the classroom, though, is because of the reduced processing time, you can uh, do twice as many prints in any given lab period. So in effect, you're, you're sort of speeding up the learning process, which I think is the, is the key to a good education. We're also in an age of environmental awareness. How mm -hmm. does this impact the environment? Well, as, as was indicated on the, um, on the other news article about our pilot program mm -hmm. for uh, the recycling of uh, plastic and other parts uh, uh, with, with labs, Kodak does have a strong commitment to the environmental impact of all our products. And in fact, that's one of the top priorities uh, that we look at when we consider introducing any new products into the marketplace. And, and the RA chemistry has followed along that lines and has been formulated specifically to have a lot less impact on the environment. One of the added benefits uh, for the user is that, as an example, the, uh, the developer doesn't contain any more benzyl alcohol, which makes it easier to mix and, uh, and, and quicker also. So there's, uh, there's two benefits, one for the environment and one for the user. Bob Miller, thank you for being with us. My pleasure. And now on to news from the world of photo education. On January 12, 1990, the Kodak Education Advisory Council held its annual meeting in New York City, where they were hosted by Ben Fernandez of the new school, Parsons School of Design. The 12-member member council is made up of photo educators from around the United States and serves as advisor on the Professional Photography Scholarship, Lecture, and Product Grant Program in the field of photo education. This past fall, the fourth annual Kodak Chair of Photography Visual Arts Series of Lectures and Workshops got underway at Ryerson Polytechnical Institute in Toronto, Canada. This program brings recognized professionals from a wide range of disciplines to the Ryerson campus. Since 1986, more than 40 artists, filmmakers, and photographers have participated in the series. Now, results are in from the November 9, 1989 Techniques of the Masters show. We asked who you'd most like to see on upcoming programs, and we received over 125 names. Towards the top of that list were Jerry Yulesman, William Albert Allard, Arnold Newman, and Gordon Parks, all photographers you'll be seeing on upcoming programs. In fact, you'll be seeing Arnold Newman in just a few minutes. Techniques will be announcing our 1990-91 schedule on our next program, which will be on Thursday, April 5th. Our guest photographers will be William S. McIntosh and Gordon Parks. The posters for that show will be going out in mid-March. To get your signed poster for watching today's show live, just send in the response form that was included with the posters for today's show. Please answer all the questions, because your input helps us make each show more interesting and useful for you. And don't forget the secret question on line number 10. As you know, this show not only covers photographers, but photographic events as well. And we'd like to know what events are most important to you. So on line number 10, write in the name of the photographic event that you'd like to see us cover on an upcoming show. When we get your response, we'll send you a premium grade poster from today's show. And if you're one of those lucky first 200 respondents, you'll be getting a signed copy. These posters are our way of saying thank you for participating and helping us out with planning these shows. And also, if you're watching us live and you haven't called our 1-800-44-Kodak extension 910 number this year, please do so within the next week. We're now compiling the names of all our live receive sites on a computer list to help information and promotional materials get to you sooner. In workshop news, the 1990 Photography and Travel Workshop Directory 
is available from Photographer's Forum. To get a copy, you can write to Photography and Travel Workshop Directory, Photographer's Forum, Department EVC, 511 Olive Street, Santa Barbara, California, 93101. Mailings have also gone out for the Eddie Adams Workshop, which is scheduled for October 12th through the 15th. This workshop brings together students and working photojournalists in an intensive four-day workshop. To qualify, applicants must be students or have no more than two years of professional experience. They also need the recommendation from either their professor or photo editor and submit a portfolio of 20 35 millimeter color or black and white slides with corresponding captions. For more information, you can write to the Eddie Adams Workshop, P.O. Box 4182, Grand Central Station, New York, New York, 10163. The application deadline is April 30th. Another deadline approaching is for the College Photographer of the Year competition held at the University of Missouri School of Journalism. And to tell us more about it, let's turn our attention to executive producer Ken Lassiter. Good afternoon, Ken. Thanks, Debbie. The College Photographer of the Year competition is conducted annually to help young photographers evaluate their abilities as visual communicators and to compare their work with that of their peers. Last year, in the 44th contest, 259 college photographers entered 6,000 images. A panel of three professionals spent over 20 hours selecting winners in the 14 categories. The winning images make up a 50-print traveling exhibit, which is available alone to schools for the cost of the shipping. The highest honor is given to the College Photographer of the Year, who is selected by the judging team on the basis of an entire portfolio of work. Last year, this prestigious award was won by Amy Deputy from Western Kentucky University. Her work was recognized for its depth and understanding. Every picture was strong in her portfolio. It looked like it belonged there. She won awards in several areas, including sports, spot news, portrait, and picture story. But it was her 12-picture documentary of the daily life of a poor family in Jamestown, Kentucky, that received the most attention. Today, we're fortunate to have her with us. Amy, welcome to Techniques of the Masters. <laughs> Tell me, what does the uh, College Photographer of the Year win? Um, the College Photographer, you win opportunity to meet some wonderful, wonderful people, um, opportunity to enter National Geographic, $1,000, um, 100 rolls of film, and a, ca a Canon camera, a trip to Missouri, a trip to Rochester. <laughs> um, <laughs> Sounds like you've been lots. having a lot of fun. Yeah, right, it's, great. it's been a real good year. Uh, how did you, have you had the uh, internship at National Geographic yet? I finished that um, the first week in January, and it was, it was a wonderful, it's a wonderful three months. Has that affected Washington. your photography? Yeah, I think um, from that I've learned that the most important thing is that you shoot pictures from your heart. And you shoot pictures from your heart, that's, that's where they come from. Okay. <laughs> Tell me, uh, where were you and what were you doing when you learned you were College Photographer of the Year for 1989? I was working in a whorehouse. Oh dear. <laughs> I was we better explain this. Shooting pictures um, um, for a story at the Register Guard at an Oregon so where I was interning. And I found out at about 2 o'clock in the morning. You were in uh, Nevada? Right. Right. Okay, right. good. Well, I remember the hooping and hollering on the phone when you found out about yeah. it. So <laughs> Tell me, do you think you're watching in Western Kentucky today? I think they are. Good, yeah. good. Well, thanks very much for being here. And now, tell me, do you have any advice for the students who are considering entering? Um, send in your best pictures and the pictures that mean the most to you. Send a good, solid portfolio and work like heck for about the next eight weeks and get it in on time. That's, That's good it. advice. <laughs> this year will mark the 45th College Photography Video Competition. If you want more information about this contest, you can write to Julie Ostrom, CPOY coordinator, at the University of Missouri in Columbia, the School of Journalism, Columbia, Missouri, 65201. And if you decide to enter, good luck. Thanks very much for being with us, Amy. We appreciate having you here. Debbie, back to you. Thanks, Ken, and congratulations, Amy. Another contest coming up is the 8th Annual Texas High School Shootout, sponsored by East Texas State University. 
This contest is open to Texas high school photographers and closes February 28th. For further information, write to ETSU Photographic Society, High School Shootout, ETSU Department of Journalism and Graphic Arts, Box D, ET Station, Commerce, Texas, 75428. And finally, a couple of updates on our growing family of master photographers. You may recall that on our last show, we talked with Peter B. Kaplan, that daring photographer of high places. Well, since then, Peter, who has scaled tall buildings and great heights, has had an accident. It seems he slipped on a patch of glare ice while walking along the flat, sea-level streets of Manhattan. Peter was hospitalized with a broken hip and can be seen here with his wife and daughter. We also understand that his new phone message greets callers with Kaplan Crisis Center, Pediatrics, Geriatrics, and Theatrics. Peter, our best wishes on a speedy recovery, and we're glad you weren't on assignment when it happened. Also recovering is John Sexton from a busy Christmas of completing and mailing his new book, Quiet Light. John was on our first techniques program, and this book is simply beautiful. If you know of John's environmental photography, you'll want to have a copy of this book. And if you haven't seen the work of this master black and white image maker, this is the book to get. Congratulations, John, and keep up the good photography. And congratulations, too, to Gregory Heisler, whose portrait of Ed Koch was chosen by the mayor to be his official portrait. The selection of Greg's image, shot for the New York Times Magazine, marks the first time a New York City mayor will be officially remembered by a photograph and not by a painting. And here's some news for all of our viewers that might have missed one of our programs. The techniques of the masters in half-hour edited segments will be carried as a professional photography series on the cable subscription service, The Learning Channel, beginning this April. These shows will provide an excellent opportunity to see your favorite masters at work again. Each segment in the series of 10 programs will be repeated three times during the week, and the entire series will be rebroadcast again in the fall. Consult your local cable guide to find out availability and the viewing times for your area. If you have any questions or suggestions about this program, the products or events we have discussed, would like literature on the RA products we discussed, or would like the spring schedule for the Learning Channel Professional Photography Series, please write to Ken Lassiter, Eastman Kodak Company, Professional Photography Division, 343 State Street, Rochester, New York, 14650-0402. And now let's go on a museum tour. Ken? Thanks, Debbie. When people think of photography, they think of taking pictures. But the field of photography is really much broader than that. It's the job of the museums to collect photography and photographic equipment and to display these things in a way that explains what they all mean and how our present relates to our past. As we look at the National Museum of Photography, Film, and Television in Bradford, England, Keep this in mind, that they're trying to make the museum experience more than just looking at prints on a wall or reading books. They're trying to open up their vast collections and make them more accessible to scholars and students and to the general public. The museum is built around an IMAX theater, which uses 70 millimeter film to produce an incredible large screen image. But the museum also has the space to build some very interesting displays. Let's join the keeper, Colin Ford, as he took our cameras for a tour. Welcome to the National Museum of Photography, Film, and Television in Bradford, England. This museum, founded in 1983, houses important displays ranging from the biggest cinema screen in Britain to the earliest television pictures and some important and dramatic news photographs and archives. Come on, let's visit. I think the mission of the museum is to explain to everybody out there in the world the mysteries of these three media, photography, film, and television. All of them meet those media every day in their life. Everybody takes photographs, everybody's been photographed, people have been to movie houses, people watch television. But I don't think they really understand the way those media are made, the techniques of them, and therefore, ultimately, what is the message that they ought to get out of them. I suppose the single most popular exhibit if you can call it an exhibit in the National Museum of Photography, Film and Television, is the IMAX Theatre. You have a number of IMAX theatres in North America, but there's only one in Britain. We were the first when it opened in 1983, and we're still the only one. And 
about 40% of our visitors, in other words, getting on for 400,000 people a year, buy tickets for the IMAX theatre. Projection equipment's about the size of the car that you drove in here today, and it uses 70 millimeter film running sideways. So the frame size of an IMAX film is 10 times the size of a conventional 35 mil film, which is why we can produce such extraordinarily good images over such a large area with one picture very brightly and very evenly lit in focus from corner to corner. It's an extraordinary sensation because once you've settled down in the steeply raked theatre and looked at it, you lose the edges of the picture. Your eye assumes you're in the real world, which means that you sometimes feel sick and you sometimes feel excited and you sometimes want to close your eyes, but you're always excited. IMAX is wonderful. The next most popular exhibit, I would guess, is our working television station, where we try to give the public a notion of what it is actually like to work in a television station, and they can use the cameras and edit the programmes and read the news and try uh, colour separation overlay, chroma key, to transport them to any part of the world. And I think, though it hasn't quite become the third most popular exhibit yet, because it's only two months old, my guess is the Kodak Museum, which tells in a most spectacular and innovative way the history of popular photography, photography for and by the person in the street. My guess is that's going to be the third most popular. So this is the uh, Kodak Museum. Indeed, and this is where we begin to tell the story of popular photography. Um, which traces the history of the way in which it's reached everybody from 1839 in here, in the very first gallery, right the way around through 150 years to photography for everybody at the modern period. Photography becomes popular from 1850 onwards with the introduction of glass and wet collodion. And so what we've done is a look at the way in which photography goes into the home. And what we've done is to set it in a Victorian sitting room with all the glass and the photographs and the carte de visites and the albums and the portraits and the stereo viewers. But one of the things that we have to remember is that here in England, one of the ways in which the working class people found photography was through the magic lanternist. And he did this in the churches and the chapels, and they went out and used this as a method of reaching the people with their message about don't drink and the demon drink, and show people around the world. What do we have in, in the Victorian period is the fact that most photography at this period was incredibly cumbersome. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's a dark tent. I mean, that's the kind of stuff you had to take your cameras on the tripod. We move now into this other period, which is when the introduction of the dry plate. And what's really fascinating is, is the introduction of the roll film. And, you know, in 1888, this appears. And this is the original Kodak. And what's marvellous about this thing is, in fact, that, you know, it took 100 exposures, and more significantly, when you finish with it, you post the whole thing back to the factory and they process the film for you, the beginnings of the DMP industry. Right, so what we've done here is actually to look at the way in which viewfinders developed over the period, and we've made this into an interactive display. And if you see, what you do is you point the camera and you fire the shutter mm -hmm. and it makes a target yeah. move. And the mm -hmm. idea of that is to show how the whole thing developed, because we like interactive displays, so mm -hmm. that really what we're doing is making the public aware through handling stuff rather than not. And of course, you know, one of the great other inventions and introductions was the Browner here, which reduced the price of the camera down from five guineas in 1888 to five shillings. So at that point, photography really starts to kind of take off and become popular. And in jumping now into the next gallery here, what we've got is in 1931, this wonderful trophy for the, very, for the world's best snapshot. So that Kodak organised this amazing kind of um, competition which was worldwide and they offered this international prize of £4,000, which meant that the guy who won it, who lived here in Manchester, actually could have bought a row of houses with that money. It was a great deal of money. And here in the very last galleries, what we've got is the modern period, which is the bit which brings us up to date, and looks at the way in which photography really has reached practically everybody. And the whole museum is actually built on the concept that every one of our visitors owns a museum object. But at the very end of the gallery, we come to this display, yeah. which actually looks at... That the whole way in which photography is kind of converging technologies and is asking the question, will this become the family album of the future, the television screen? Because, you know, you'll have access through still video and through your video, and that's where you're going to receive your information. It's going to be important to everybody. I think it is. Yes. Well, the percentage of time that people view their television set cameras sets mm -hmm. are, has gone up dramatically. This is popular with the kids, I'll bet, too. Oh, this is where they all pop around on that screen, right. yeah. Yes. Very good.
we had, when we opened the museum, three portrait studios. An 1860s one, a real daylight studio, where you can sit in front of a genuine 1860s camera, be told that given the amount of daylight coming in at that moment, you have got to sit still for 40 seconds and look smiling and happy and relaxed and natural. And of course, the visitor learns that that is totally impossible to do. Lesson number one about portrait photography. We then have a 1930 studio, which replaces daylight with electric light. And we go through a whole sequence of how you use an old mercury vapor lamp, how you use spotlights and floodlights to change what your model looks like. We used to have a modern portrait studio, and that's actually become subsumed by some of the later developments in the museum, because we believe that a really lively, active, modern museum has to change all the time. And if you're a museum in the media, you have to change even faster. The photograph library of the Daily Herald newspaper is certainly the biggest item in our collection because it has 1,300,000 photographs in it, roughly so. I've never actually counted them. And the newspaper itself, which closed in 1964, was alternately the newspaper of the Labour Party and of the Trades Union Congress. So it's an unrivaled visual history of labor relations and the labor movement in this country. And we have lots of film pieces of apparatus, not all of which, in fact, very few of which are on display now because we haven't got film galleries. But one of the things which I think is the most handsome is one of the rather rare Technicolor three-strip cameras, which is one of the few bits of apparatus that always gives me great pleasure just to look at it without even thinking about how it was used. One more object, perhaps in photography, we have the last of the great big long toms, as they were called, huge cameras that were made before the Japanese showed us that we could take photographs a long way away with quite small lenses, which was used to take news photographs of objects a long way away. And if you think that's a quaint old historical object, it was made in 1953. You mentioned that you really are an educational institution. Tell us some more about your educational program. Well, in a sense, of course, we hope that everybody who comes into the museum is being educated in some shape or form. If they don't go out of the museum having learnt at least one important thing about the media, we failed. But we do, alongside that, have a very active formal education program. What is now very exciting is that schools that came to us six years ago and have been coming six years running have developed some enormously sophisticated film and television and photography techniques mm. The director of education in this city tells me that every school in the city has a piece of work somewhere on the walls that derives from work at the, at the National Museum of Photography, Film and Television. And increasingly, we're finding that schools and colleges from the other end of England, or even Europe, come and spend a week to do a concentrated educational visit with us. Very, I think, ambitious and pioneering educational work. Most of your exhibits here are interactive in that people can, can touch the uh, equipment and turn knobs and push buttons and, and be a part of it. Uh, why did you decide to have that kind of uh, museum? Because however much fun the museum is, and we believe it's a lot of fun, we are actually an educational institution. And I, well, I better not accuse anybody else. I don't learn things by just sitting down and reading words and looking at pictures. I need to have something to cement things in my memory. If I have a chance of trying out a technique for myself, or if, as you can do in this museum, you are confronted suddenly with a larger than life-size camera, a 35 mil camera that is bigger than you are, we believe, and I think probably we, we believe this more strongly than any other museum I've ever been to, that you can't actually quite understand the media without understanding the technology. We try to give equal weight to the pictures and the technology which produces them. We try to say to our curators, never display a camera without showing the picture that that camera has taken. Try and explain the link between the software and the hardware, if you like. If you have all these kind of big dramatic events happening to you, I think there's just a chance that you remember those and the lesson, therefore, that we're trying to put across is remembered by everybody. You might be wondering why this museum isn't in London. The reason is the British government felt their national museum should be distributed all around England to make them accessible to people all over the country. But if any of you are ever in London and you want to go to the museum, it's a very pleasant two-hour train ride from Charing Cross Station. As I'm sure you saw from this piece, museums are fascinating places. 
When we go to them, we can't resist the temptation to poke around a little bit in their vaults. To that end, as we started on our last program, we'd like to continue peeking at some of the archive treasures of the George Eastman House. This is a very special album we have here. Tell us about it. Ken, this is one of the most unique Victorian albums in the United States, and I might say almost the entire world. Uh, it is an album put together by one single gentleman, a man by the name of Thomas Brumby Johnston, who lived in Edinburgh in the 1850s, and he was able to collect some of the rarest and most beautiful images done in Victorian England, as well as France and, and Australia, and to put them together in an album, uh, his personal album, of uh, favorites, you might say. Collected beautiful portraits by uh, Deal Hill and Robert Adamson uh, and by others. He also has in here, rather surprisingly, images by the person who invented the entire negative positive paper process, paper photographic process, uh, William Henry Fox Talbot. Here's an image from Talbot's Pencil of Nature of 1843, 44 as well as, surprisingly, an image by Frederick Scott Archer. And Archer, as you may remember, is the man who invented the wet collodion process, the glass plate mm -hmm. negative, which was the first major modification of Talbot's paper negative process. There are images, as I said, from France, and even some very early ones from Melbourne, Australia, which, uh, according to the Australian specialists, are very, very rare, such as this view of uh, oxen uh, in, the, in this uh, main street of Melbourne. 1856. Dated 1856. Boy, the images are beautiful, and it's in excellent condition. It's what been very well preserved. Yeah. Yes, what a privilege to see it. Thank you for showing it to me. You're welcome, Ken. I'd like to thank Robert Sobiezak for his help in producing that piece, and to Jim Inyot of the museum staff for opening their doors to our cameras and helping us see how photography has changed over the years. Many of the images we saw in the book Robert showed us were portraits. Since photographers began making pictures, the human image has been one of the most frequently recorded subjects. I don't think any photographer can take a portrait and not owe something to the great photographers such as Julia Margaret Cameron, Edward Steichen, Alfred Stieglitz, and our guest today, Arnold Newman. Even by avoiding his strong, evocative style of symbolic portrait, uh, photographers are influenced by him. Arnold is a true master. The strength of his images has made them icons we remember people by. Who can forget his portraits of Stravinsky or Picasso? We wanted to see how he makes an image, so we asked Arnold to let us sit in on a portrait session. The subject was commercial photographer Gregory Heisler, a former assistant of Arnold's with whom he is quite comfortable. Now what you're going to see is a 71-year-old man working in a very hot 98-degree room but that what you're also going to see is a true master photographer making an image. All right. Looking here. Wow! <laughs> hold it, 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 hold it. Don't move around while I'm shooting. I'll murder you. I can't shoot you. We came in. I, I, uh, Greg had made the suggestion I take a look at his apartment. And I thought, gee, that'd be fine. And uh, I was almost sure we were going to do it in the studio. I'd seen the studio. I liked the studio and so forth. And I wanted to, but I just want to be sure. And I walked in, and there, you never can tell, there was a much better situation. It was more personal. Only these don't break away. Sit. Over here? Yeah, sure. The simplicity of all this, the lines which work with me, that I can work with, but still is his. I try to find this melting of uh, my ideas combined with a, uh, what I feel is a good interpretation of the subject. And uh, where it all comes together. And this is more typical of my, well, I won't say my better pictures, but I'm, I'm able to use the natural light. I'm able to use the things that are here. I keep seeing pictures, which is good. You have to have an instinct about people. Just that little bit moving here and just a little bit of expression, a difference. Particularly when they're on, they're very self-conscious about being on. And uh, if you don't have that instinct, you're not going to be able to photograph people. Most people do, but they have to develop it. You do have to have 
an instinct about people. Now, it's the same thing as having an ability to take photographs. They are. Ah! <laughs> Boy, 90 degree heat, you gotta do this damn stuff. Just, while I have a minute, I'm gonna, you know, I'm looking, getting ideas. Not bad idea. Didn't say it was good, it's not bad. There are times I'll go into a place there's no light at all. Stay there. You know, like that Gene Smith story. Can Again, I don't mean to uh, use anything that's available. Strobe, flashlights, you know, we brought along a lot of lights and everything else. We didn't need it. Where I needed extra light, I just simply opened up the blinds of the window on the other side of the room and it filled in exactly the way I wanted it to. Where'd Greg go? We got a picture. I can only find Greg! <laughs> I don't know if you wanted white in there or not. White would be better than red because we're shooting in black and white. Okay. I mean, but I don't have to use these at all. Either way. <laughs> Shut up and get in there. <laughs> now, basically, my problem was Greg. Generally, when you're working with somebody, you have a relationship. My assistants learn to stay in the background, and it sort of becomes an interrelationship with you uh, and, and your subject. Somebody sees me working <laughs> or sitting here in my workrooms, they think, ah, oh, what an easy life of it. They don't know the aggravation, the long, long hours, how hard it is to work. Uh, it's fairly exhausting. I can go home and just collapse. Sometimes I'm too tired even to sleep. And it doesn't get easier as you get older. And uh, there are times when uh, uh, you just wonder whether everything is worth it. But then you realize no matter what you go into, if you want to do it right, you've got to work that way. I started off, uh, in a sense, I'm not knowing of uh, establishing another way of looking at portraiture. I wanted to get something that was completely real, but com completely controlled when I started to do my portraits. Instead of these horrible, artificial, over-retouched pictures that I was doing for a living, because that maybe created my uh, revolt against uh, that kind of artificial studio picture. I was going out at lunchtime and weekends shooting for myself, saying, you know, I have ideas about portraiture, and I wonder, if, you know, I'd like to see who's done that. And I came up to the Museum of Modern Art and was allowed to look through their files, and there was nothing like what I had in mind there, so I said, well, let's try. It never occurred to me that I was creating a minor kind of uh, shake-up, and, uh, but then people like labels. As I told you, I hate labels, and they immediately pinned the label of the environmental portrait. The people forget is almost immediately, almost from the beginning, they were not only environmental, they were uh, symbolic. The, the, the Stravinsky portrait, as you know, with the piano, is not an environmental portrait. It's a symbolic one. And uh, if you want to use it, I didn't even think of it. In those. When I got finished, then I can put a label on it, you see. Big deal. Uh, I just think that you just turn out good pictures and uh, let the world decide what it's all about. You have to satisfy yourself first, and yeah, then you'll be able to satisfy more people afterwards. <laughs> good, your lips together. Good. Head up. Good. Ah. Well, maybe. Wait a minute, once more. Wait a minute. Uh-huh. And just that little bit of a smile, that's it. Hold it, don't move, don't move, don't move to where's my foot, hit, hit, that. <laughs> Look at that. <laughs> hold it, hold it, hold it. Good. Who said you can't take a one second exposure and it is sharp? Now. Always show, or at least make believe, you're in charge of the situation. And there's something else that's very, very important. A lot of photographers don't seem to understand. It is an ordeal 
have your picture taken. It's a very self-conscious act. And people, even presidents of the United States and prime ministers, they're uncomfortable with it. And uh, so you have to take that into consideration and make people feel at ease, be sympathetic, be understanding. People are always moving, always changing. And you say, hold still, don't move, you know, and that sort of thing. And it's very natural. But what is unnatural is that they hold it for like three or four minutes. So you have to reassure them. They say, this is not natural. I said, that's where you stood. I said, it's unnatural to stay that way for a long time. Very often, I'll just stall until some executive finally gets this way. And when the hell is he going to begin? And I'll have to do my usual, if you move, I'll kill you. Hold it, or I'll murder you. Hey, man, don't move. This one is really nice. After all the rest of that, was just a warm up. If you move, I'll murder you. How many times have you heard me say that? <laughs> and you <I> moved! <laughs> Good, hold it. Great. Put that hand down just a trifle. That's it. You had your head tilted just a bit. All right. Good, hold it. I did that to a senator once. He doubled over with laughter. I lost the picture. <laughs> you know, my whole life is in here. It's 50 years of work. These are about to be re-edited. Mm. Uh, we're now cleaning up, <laughs> so to speak. <laughs> you can look up uh, uh, Kennedy. Maybe let's see if we can find Kennedy in here. Uh, here we are, and all the different portraits or different kind of pictures I did of him over the years, some for him. Imagine that was Kennedy. We wandered around for half a day around the Senate, kibitzing and talking, and I think I said hello to as many people as he did. Well, of course, everybody knew him. <laughs> uh, here's Richard Nixon. Of course, I did Nixon. Somewhere in there is Johnson in there. I did three senators within about two or three days that eventually became vice president of the United States. Oh, that's uh, amazing. And, and presidents of the United States. Y your photographs have almost become icons that we remember many of these people by. Do you think your work affects them somewhat? Well, I don't know whether it affects them. They like the pictures. I mean, this sort of thing comes after the fact. And if they are, you say, rem remembered by, if they're famous enough, to say they're remembered by this photograph by me or whatever, anybody else, uh, they're too big a person to be affected by them. They, they like the pictures. Uh, yeah, I think the one picture probably used more often for Picasso is beginning to be my picture. You know, that's somebody wrote about that. Or the Stravinsky picture. He loved it. Uh, as a matter of fact, after I'd photographed him for a few years, it started to appear all over the world. And so a few years later, a magazine asked me to go out and photograph him. I said, I can't photograph him. After that, I, how can I possibly go back and do him again? He said, if you don't go out to Hollywood, Arnold, because that's where he was actually living. Uh, he said, we'll send somebody else. I said, no, no, all right, I'll go. I went up to the, went out there, went up to the house, was on the hills, and his wife told me to be quiet, he'll be down in a few minutes. He had been very ill up until that point. And he came down on two canes at that point, I'll never forget, a dead silence. And he walks up very serious-like, and I'm standing there, I hadn't seen him in years. He walks up very seriously, and puts his two canes down, walks over to me and suddenly embraces me, and with a big grin he said, Arnold Newman, you have made me famous. <laughs> Stick your hat on. I'm doing what I normally don't do. There's so many in one thing, but I just, I just love this concept. Ah, uh, lean. Not too much. No, 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 no. <laughs> you like one of these models, you know. <laughs> This is the way I get my exercise, back and forth and back and forth. Then I came in with a closer lens. I didn't like it close up. 
And I came back and I studied okay. the darn thing and I said, you recall, Greg, stick your foot out. Because suddenly I realized the incongruous thing of having that leg stuck out there like it doesn't even belong to him, but you know it does. And suddenly I said, I think we have it. You know what is missing in photography is humor. Very, very, very few photographers are good at humor. Everybody takes themselves so seriously. They never, they never, somehow they seem to have lost themselves, they lost their sense of humor when they got into photography. Do the same thing, wait a minute, no, do the same thing you've been doing, right? No, no, you were doing this, that's it. Just under your, that's it. No, here, that's it. <laughs> good, hold that, hold it, hold it. Great. I think I finally got your portrait. I really do. I'm just getting the planes in place. The plane in Spain gains mainly in the developer. Kind of. Yeah. Okay. Now, hold it. Now, tilt your head that way. No, keep, keep turning it. Uh-huh. No, 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 Oh, there was movement Sorry. on that. You still there? <laughs> Good. All right, at last, the picture again. <laughs> Without a good education, where the hell are you? It's a terrible thing to say, but you can't teach art. You can open up doors and windows. For me, it's so exciting to see a new young voice there. And so discouraging to find out that sometimes you'll see a voice who's got a certain amount of ability but because a lack of knowledge is not creating anything new but copying the past. But I think not only in photography, but in all the arts, we seem to be in a wavering place. So many of the photographs, photographers today, are repeating the past in order to find the future, perhaps. And when we find the future, they, we may either accept it or not. I don't know if you get the first time my wife and I kept looking at each other. We had separated during the exhibit. He said, we got a great photographer you to see. I said, no, I got one. Turned out to be Judy Dater, first time she ever showed. One expresses oneself, one's own emotions and experience. But that is not enough. It isn't enough to have these feelings. You also have to be an artist. And there are very few people who can be that convincing. And there's a lot of them who are almost. So, and this is what's wrong with so many of the professional organizations, so many of the schools just say, this is the way to take a photograph, the only way, the best way, forget it. Run like hell, I advise the students. Say, this is where you begin, but you know, the world is your oyster. You can do anything you want, but prove it to us. We'll see. All right, one last one. <laughs> Hold it. Put that foot out like that. Uh-huh, good. All right, that's a 35 cent deposit, please. <laughs> we are done. <laughs> oh, God, thank you. You have to observe, observe, observe. And then you're thinking about ideas and you're thinking about specific images. I'm always planning my next picture, even when I don't know what it is. And that's what's so important. Keep thinking, keep thinking. Keep working on ideas. Sometimes you can only find them when you get there. Sometimes you can create them. Sometimes you can anticipate them. But they're always there. it's time to hear from you. It's time for you to call our master, Arnold Newman. Arnold, it's time to welcome you to Techniques of the Masters. We're glad to have you here. We've been looking forward to this for a long time. Uh, I've been too. <laughs> okay, great. You know, it's obvious that you and uh, Greg have a very special relationship. He was once your assistant, and I know he's been uh, part of your life for a long time now. 
he has part of my life, my wife's life, and then he got married, and it's a very, it's like a son to us, I guess mm -hmm. you would say. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's why this shot, this shooting, is not typical. There's a lot more kidding around and a lot less formal than it would be for the President of the United States. Or, oh, you, don't, you wouldn't yell at the President like you yell at Greg? Uh, not exactly. <laughs> I, say, okay. I can kid. You have to know how far you go. but You can kid around, but uh, I was concerned because it was more informal. Right. We do relax with people that we know or get to know and be friends with. This right. is probably an extreme. Thank you. But it was great fun. Okay. Now it's time to have your calls. The uh, number in the United States is to call 1-800-262-3144. And in the Canada and Mexico, you can call us collect at 0-716-724-0107. Our first call is on the line. It's from Steve Bolp from Jamestown Community College in Jamestown, New York. Steve, can you hear us? Yes, I can. Hi, Anna. Hi. Um, my first question is, um, how were you inspired to become a photographer? Well, I sort of fell into it. I, uh, uh, I was studying art, and the Great Depression came along. You probably read about that. Couldn't continue in my studies. Offered a job in Philadelphia where I had a lot of friends who were studying under the great Brodovich. And they went out to take pictures one night. We stayed up all night. And it was so exciting, I thought I would try it temporarily. And after 51 years, it's still temporary, but uh, maybe it'll last for a while. I just, I just found so much excitement in it that I just couldn't leave. I'm still trying it out. Right. Um, my second question is, um, have there been any photographers that have been influential, influential in your work? Or in what that have what? Uh, that have been influ um, influential. In influential? Yeah. Quite a number, because particularly in the mid-30s, when all this happened, uh, and I was studying art, there was so many influences, uh, both abstraction, the old classic artists, uh, the old classic uh, photographers, and modern photographers, Steichen, Stiglitz, uh, Man Ray, the Farm Security Administration, particularly uh, Walker Evans. There were so many that you can't say there was one particular one. Uh, maybe that was helpful, or else I might have not come out being my own person. I was influenced by many. Well, thank you very much. I enjoy um, the work I've seen, and I hope to see some more sometime. <laughs> All right. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks very much for calling, Steve. Our next caller is Tracy Mitchell from Florida A&M University in Tallahassee. Tracy, you're on the air with your question. Yes, yeah, I have uh, two quick questions for you. Um, one, how much of your personal work uh, do you do compared to your commercial work? Well, they're inseparable. Uh, I'm fairly lucky that so much of the work uh, all through my career, and it's increased, uh, it's been pretty much what I would want to do for my so-called personal work. Uh, I think that very often if you get a job to do, and you go on out and do the best job you can, uh, you will find that it becomes your personal work. You're proud of it. And uh, some of the things I did early on in ads and things like that wound up in museums, if you want to use that criteria. But I think it's important. Uh, people now talk about uh, art photography they're, and all that sort of nonsense. And I think it's nonsense because they're giving themselves the title as a great artist. That's nonsense. They forget about people like Otterbridge, Penn, so many photographers that have done commercial work and wound up being so-called art photography. I think it's just you do the best job you can and let the chips may fall where they may and you just, just let your commercial work be your personal work and you'll have fun. Does okay. that answer it? Yeah. <laughs> Doesn't sound Tra like it does. <laughs> Tracy, thanks very much for your call. Thanks. Next, we'll take a uh, question from one of our students in the audience. Who has a question ready? Teresa Amy, Onondaga Community College. Um, how do you keep yourself seeing things in a fresh way? You know. How do you know, I like? I'm sorry. Speak up. How, how do you keep yourself? seeing things in a fresh way by not seeing things at an everyday basis. You know, new ideas, new fresh looks. Well, you've got to keep looking at the world. There's so many new things every day that you see. There's so many new writers, so many new photographers, so many new 
painters, and it always gives you ideas. There's so many things happening. The world, the world certainly isn't the same today as it was a year ago. I mean, the excitement going on. And the same thing happens to our own worlds, sometimes good, sometimes bad. And these should stimulate ideas within you visually. I'm always looking around, figuring out my next photograph, even when I don't know what it is. This is what you've got to learn to do. You've got to keep thinking, keep this excitement going. Part of life. Otherwise, you're not going to grow over the age of 92. I mean. <laughs> okay? Thank, Thank you. you, Teresa. Next is a uh, call from Bob Fausch from the University of New Orleans in New Orleans, New Orleans Louisiana. Hello? Yes, I'd like, Hi, I'd like to thank you first for One Mind's Eye. It's helped me tremendously for my life, and it's not only in my photography, but in my painting. And I'd also like to say, evidently, your work really agrees with you because you still look as young now as you did in the, in the book. Now, the question is, how much do you control which photograph is finally uh, uh, released? Uh, the Stravinsky's in the book, for instance, you have a number of them with check marks by them, and there's the one that's uh, shot, the one that you've printed. Do you control that completely, or does the sitter? Well, it's a matter of control. Uh, no editor can use a picture they don't see or get. Uh, the one thing about the Stravinsky picture was commissioned by the great art director Brodovich of Harper's Bazaar, and it was rejected. <laughs> it's one of the better known rejects in photography. But I've been able to insist upon showing people exactly what I want them to see. Uh, at Life Magazine, I used to, in the beginning, I was called the man who made no mistakes. I made lots of mistakes. I simply didn't show them my contacts or show them bad photographs. You have to learn to have control over your life, control over your pictures. Once you do that, you're on your way. Does that answer your question? You would steer away from showing them the contact sheet then if you had something or that you didn't care for. You would just do prints and show them. Yeah, but you have to understand that uh, much of my work is in large format. Not all. I've done some 35. So I can pull out a 35 or, or any color that I don't like, uh, but uh, I can cut off uh, four by five, just simply discard them, uh, contact sheets in black and white and so on. The idea is you should do the preliminary editing and frankly they're appreciative. They don't want to have to wade through hundreds of pictures. They want to see the best pictures that are made. Oh, you'll find an occasional art director who thinks you're holding back on him. But why? You want to always give your very best. And why dilute it with a bad photograph? Thank okay. you, Bob. Thanks for calling Techniques of the Masters. Incidentally, all our lines are lit, so if you're trying to get our number, please keep trying. We'll have some more call, uh, lines available shortly. Our next call is Troy Bennett from Plymouth State College in Plymouth, New Hampshire. Troy, you're on the air with your question to Arnold Newman. Hello, Mr. Newman. It's an honor to be able to ask you a question. And um, my first question is, do you have a preference for either black and white or color photography? And what do either of those mean to you personally and do you how do you decide on which to use for a particular shoot well uh... As, i'll answer the second question uh... when you're working on assignment and they ask for a color picture uh... you better turn in a color photograph or you haven't done you haven't uh, completed your commission uh... for our personal work it's a it's a matter of what you want to do what, if you're thinking in terms of color, you will work in color. Uh, a lot of photographers will, even though they work a great deal uh, in color, will work in black and white uh, because there's still, relatively speaking, more control. And this is what the problem is. I mean, our film keeps getting better and better, and it's absolutely marvelous. But the control, and I won't go into the details, I think you understand, does not have that final control that we do in black and white. It's, it's pretty, pretty well, uh, we can do it pretty well in, in black and white. Uh, there are other things of uh, translating what we have in the back of our mind. And I started out in black and white, and I think a great deal in black and white. Uh, but I think you have seen some of the color that I've done. Uh, I think you saw it uh, just before we went on, I went on the air. Does that answer your question? Y yes, it does. Um if I could 
quickly um, sneak one more in. Um, you mentioned young voices in photography today, and I was wondering if there were, or who, if any, uh, young photographers that you've got your eye on at this point. Well, there's a number of them, and if I start telling you about two or three, three or four others who I like equally as well and their friends are going to be upset. There's a lot of very good ones. There's always going to have to be some good ones, or else what's the point of looking forward in the future? <laughs> but I think the most important thing is that you just, each one of us has got to keep trying. And us older folk, we got to help you. And I think that's what's important. That's what we're here for. That's why we're trying to teach and we're trying to help. And you should come to us. I don't mind that. I, I think it's wonderful. Because I have sons who went to other fields, other people help them. It's up to our generation to help the new young people coming along. Thanks for calling us, Troy. Thank you. Our next call is from Rich Miller and Randolph Community College down in Ashboro, North Carolina. Rich, you're on the air. Hi. Uh, my question is, uh, Mr. Newman, it's two parts. Do you do your own printing? And if so, since so many of the Silver Ridge papers are no longer available, what type of papers do you use to print on? Now, what was this? Okay. <laughs> what was the first part of that question? Okay. Since many of the papers that are Silver Ridge papers are no longer available, what type of papers do you use to print on? Well, now you're asking me that question in the bosom of Kodak here. <laughs> Naturally, I use Kodak papers. I use... Uh, I use whatever the best material I can find, and I, since 1938, I've been using a lot of Kodak materials. Thank heavens they're here. Uh, I think that each person's got to look for themselves, try out the materials, try out cameras, everything for themselves. But this is only nuts and bolts. You don't take pictures with your cameras. You don't take them with the papers and the film. They're tremendous. They're tools. In the long run, you take it with your hearts and your minds. And then you reach out and figure out what film is necessary for you to do what you have to do, what paper is the best paper. That's why Kodak and everybody else prints many different kinds of papers and, may, and make many different kinds of film. I think that's about the best way you can answer that. Thank you, Arnold. I got out of that one, didn't yeah. I? <laughs> <laughs> is that helpful, Rich? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Our next call is from Leanne Potts in the Ringling School of Art in Sarasota, Florida. I'm glad to see that the Ringling School is able to watch your program. So, uh, Leanne, you're on the air. Hi, Mr. Newman. Um, your pictures show a, a great deal of psychological insight into the subject. How do you go about establishing a rapport with the sitter before you take the picture? Well, I think it comes with experience. It comes with instinct, uh, with understanding. Uh, I, I, I think that what you have to do is to observe, watching people, how they sit, how they sit. When you're not, when they don't, or they're not aware of, of you looking at them, you look at people that are sitting around in all kinds of positions, you know, and, uh, and suddenly if you ask them to hold it, they get very self-conscious. The only unnatural thing about these things is that they are holding it, which is not natural. But you have to do that, particularly when you've got to reset your camera, and focus it, and move it about a bit, and all of that sort of thing. But the basic thing is trying to work up some kind of warm relationship. You don't have to be that person's best friend. What you have to do is to make them feel you're on their side. Too many uh, photographers, particularly when they get successful, get so arrogant they act as if uh, uh, heavens know who they are. And I have known one photographer who was barred from the White House. He thought he was more important than the President of the United States. Uh, the President <laughs> told me, that particular President told me himself. You'd be surprised who it is. You have to realize that the very difficult thing to do is to pose for a photograph. It's a very self-conscious act. And you have to be sympathetic and understanding. If the sitter feels that, then you've got him in the palm of your hand, and then you will help him. Does that help you? Yes, thank you. You're welcome. Thanks for your call, Leanne. Now we'll take a call from one of our students here in the audience. Who has a question ready? Yes, I have a question. My name's Catherine Brown. Hello. Oh, my name's Catherine Brown from Onondaga Community College. And I was curious as to know, what do you look for in an apprentice? What, what type Pardon? of, what, what, what qualities do you look for in an apprentice? Or, um, an assistant. An assistant. An assistant. Assistant. Same thing. 
willingness, motivation, this is what we talked about yesterday, uh, there is nothing but absolutely nothing to, uh, as a substitute for motivation. Uh, unless you are willing to learn, make sacrifices to learn, uh, take the time. Uh, very often it's almost more important than talent. But combination of talent and motivation, you're on your way. People who are willing to come in, they're not worried about watching the clock. They're not worried about how much they're always going to get paid, they're going to get double time, things like that. That's actually rather minor. But uh, an ability to learn, an ability to learn before they got in there uh, so they can be helpful. I have to teach them sometimes, and you can tell when somebody's adaptable and willing to learn and, and that sort of thing. It's very easy to tell, almost immediately. Okay? Thank Good. you. Good. Thank you for your question. Right, next, we'll take a telephone call from Gregory Smith, who's a freelance photographer in Indianapolis, Indiana. Gregory, you're on the air with your question. Hello. Uh, I'd like to thank Kodak first for the opportunity to talk to Mr. Newman. Um, Arnold, when you started, uh, you said you were working with over-retouched commercial photography. Um, how did you cross the bridge to get into your own style? How did you find people that were intelligent enough and receptive enough to pay you for your own style? Well, of course, that took time. I started experimenting on my own. Uh, it took me three years of thinking about it and being repelled by this the regular studio. It's, uh, today, these are these plastic pictures that are done by the numbers, and they, they look alike all over the world, by the way, now. And this so repelled me that I felt that I wanted, wanted to see what they looked like. Also, uh, you would see snapshots, and you would tell more about that person from the snapshot than you would from these overposed pictures. And I had visual ideas, conceptual ideas, like an art. And I combined them, and I began to experiment, and then editors and art directors began to see them, and then I began to be published. And then I began to be called by private uh, uh, sitters as well as corporations and so on. It, it builds up. I mean, uh, there's a perfect natural way of, of progression of uh, going from client to client. You have to build up a reputation doing what you like to do best. Does that answer your question? Well, I hope, yeah. <laughs> Just one more, if you don't mind. All right. Um, I don't suppose you have to contend with work for hire. Uh, it's very much in the forefront of all of us working photographers' minds right. right now. Um, if I you have do to. have to contend with it, how do you deal with it? How do we avoid it? Well, when all this came up, I, right from the very beginning, and it was a part of my first arrangement with Life magazine, in order to get me to work, I was so uh, ignorant, I didn't realize that they thought I, they wanted me, and I didn't realize how badly, and I just kept saying, okay, well, we'll see. So finally they offered me all the rights to my photographs. That goes back to 1946, and I realized how valuable it was. And since then I've refused to work for anybody uh, unless I owned all the rights. Uh, I am asked once in a while to work for IRS. I say, absolutely not. Sometimes I lose them, sometimes I gain. It doesn't matter. Thank you, Gregory, for your call. We have time for one more call, I think. Uh, William Bacharach, an amateur photographer in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. William, you're on the air. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Newman, I am a photographer of 15 years, uh, having never done anything with it, but I've been traveling quite a bit and taking pictures of things that I like and people that I like and things that interest me. I have put together a portfolio of about 180 prints. My basic problem is what next? Well, I think I would uh, cut the portfolio down, if you want to show them the art directors, to something like about 20, 18, maybe less. You know, if you have, shall we say, 15 or 16 great photographs, or even 20 in a photograph, they say, this isn't this great. But number 22 and number 23 begins to show a little weakness. They think, oh, that's all he can do, just those 18 photographs. Show them only your best, go to the key people that you want to sell them to, whether it be magazine editors, art directors, and advertising agencies, and let them decide. I don't think I could possibly, I don't know anybody 
we'd want to look through a portfolio of 180. Oh. Decide what you want to do. Boil it down, show it to them, get their reactions. I'm not buying, I'm selling. <laughs> my, my question is, uh, I, uh, I will cut them down as, as you advise. Should I cut Anybody them? would advise that, believe me. Mm -hmm. Should I cut them down to a mixed bag, or should I have all portraits or all scenery or all flowers or all whatever? Well, you sound like you're all over the place. I, I am think, all over the place. Well, that, that's exactly it. What you should do is to decide for yourself what you want to do and go with the, your strongest suit, so to speak. Go with the things you like to do best, go with the things you love to do, and the pictures will look it. And later, if you, when you're getting a lot of work, you can say, let me try this sort of thing as well if you have use for it. Always go with your best work. That's the best advice I think I can give you. Okay? Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much, William. We have time for one more quick question from Benjamin Fisher, Glassboro State College in Glassboro, New Jersey. Benjamin, you're on the air. Thank you. Hello, Mr. Newman. I've admired your work for years, and one of the photos that often comes up in my classes is the picture of Dr. Krupp in his factory after World War II. The lighting and the camera angle make him look positively demonic. And this has brought up the question several times on ethics. Uh, what does the photographer owe to the subject, if anything, and how do you choose to portray a subject in a situation like that? Uh, I am very well aware of the problems of, eth of ethics, the morality of doing something not nice to somebody who's willing to cooperate. Go back and study Krupp's history. He used slave labor, he, he abused slave labor, allowed them to do everything but die, chained them, to, I, I won't go into it, chained them to their, uh, their machinery uh, in the factories, do it. so they wouldn't want to run away with uh, when the bombs came. He sent them off to die in uh, Auschwitz and other uh, camps, death camps. This man is beyond the pale and was beyond the pale. And then we, we sent him to jail, let him out, and I felt that when, they, when I was asked by the magazine to photograph him, I said no, and they said why not. I said, He's the devil. They said, fine, that is how okay. we think of him, and go ahead and do it. And there I was stuck with the job. I felt no regrets about putting a knife in his back and twisting it. And he didn't find uh, out about it till later. Well, about out of time. Thank okay. you very much. Okay. <laughs> Benjamin, thanks very much for our call. That's all the time we have for calls now. I'd like to thank all of the callers who've tried to get the line and didn't make it as well as those who called in and got a question. I want to thank the students here. Arnold, I want to thank you for being on our program. You made it real special for all of us. Thanks thank very you. much. Debbie, over to you to wrap it up. Thank you, Ken. Inspirational, Arnold. Thank you very much for being with us. This brings us to the end of another show. And as usual, we have enjoyed having you with us. Be sure and get your cards in for posters and set your plans to join us next April 5th for William S. McIntosh and Gordon Parks. I'd like to thank Andreas Hyman, Bob Miller, Amy Deputy, Colin Ford, Robert Sobiesic, and Arnold Newman for helping us with today's show. Thank you to our student audience and also to our phone operators from Onondaga Community College. And of course, thanks to you, our audience in the United States, Canada, and Mexico for your participation and your support. It has been a wonderful show. On behalf of Ken Lassiter, Mike Garn, and myself, good day from Rochester. <laughs>